Hello and welcome, my friends. Welcome to the first ever Punk Rock Raduno Twitch interview live stream. So I'm Franz, I'm one of the volunteers at Punk Rock Raduno. What is Punk Rock Raduno? Well, if you connected, you probably already know, but just to refresh your memory as we didn't have it for you know, a couple of years now. It's a dumb little festival based in the beautiful and small city of Bergamo in Italy. It's a volunteer-based, community-based, it's a punk rock festival, do-it-yourself ethics, no racism, no sexism, no homophobia, no violence, all ages, tomorrow the world. And uh, why we are doing this streaming? Well, because... Uh, we don't consider our little dumb festival just uh, a festival of uh, live bands playing on a stage, but a community-based festival. So something that uh, is really rooted in the punk rock scene. And, uh, you know, we, as uh, the live shows are still not happening in Italy, we just wanted to connect with uh, our friends all over the world. And we felt like, uh, you know, it was good to have some chat uh, would be good to stay together, but in particular, we felt really lonely here. So why not? Let's try to, to connect uh, and to have some, uh, some fun with it. Of course, Twitch is a new uh, platform. Uh, I know many of you are not used to it, but you will get used to it uh, very soon. And there is a lot of streamers in Italy now using it in the punk community, and they are doing really cool stuff. It's a sort of new wave of fans in, in a sort of way. And uh, if you can subscribe to the Punk Rock Raduno live stream um, and the channel, you can support us a little bit soon. And also, uh, you, we, we are planning to live stream many events of Punk Rock Raduno. So join now, and I'm sure you will be happy with it. So uh, it's not going to be me talking alone all night, but uh, we are going to have uh, at least two stars tonight. So let me introduce you the first star the first star of the evening, and uh, he is uh, probably one of the best uh, punk rock uh, songwriter and singer in Europe, and is also one of my best friends, uh, punk rock Raduno founder, and uh, probably sexiest uh, man of his age uh, in the punk scene. Let me introduce you the beautiful Andrea Caredda from the Menges and the Veterans and the Punk Rock Raduno. Hey, ciao, Hello. ciao, everybody. Ciao, Franz. <laughs> Did you like my introduction? The introduction, I was, I'm kind of su surprised, but <laughs> uh, beautiful <laughs> eyes. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, you know, we are speaking uh, English to each other just because we want to connect to all our friends outside of Italy. Uh, those are the friends that used to make the Raduno even more beautiful uh, because it's a gathering of people from uh, all over the world, we can say. Uh, Franz, how are you? I'm actually pretty good. You know, I am uh, I miss you. I want to see you soon. And I want to see, you know, just the fact that uh, lots of people is already writing in the chat and we invite you to write in the chat uh, to connect. Uh, his writing is making me feel uh, less lonely. Of course, I miss uh, live events. Edone, which is the venue where uh, Punk Rock Raduno is based, uh, is still closed. Uh, it's going to reopen at the 13th of uh, June. Uh, I of May, sorry. May. Oh, May. M May, May. And uh, I know Scaletta Rock Club is reopening too in La Spezia the same day. Yes, so. on the same day. Yeah, May 13th. That's beautiful. And, uh, you know, we... <laughs> I'm afraid to say this, but we are gonna see. We are seeing now the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, slowly we are gonna yeah. see that. Let's so. hope the light at the end of the tunnel is not a train coming your way. <laughs> no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, first of all, Punk Rock are doing news because soon we are gonna have a big star talking here and. Uh, what happened with the Punk Rock Raduno World? Do you want to say what, what happened lately, what we announced last week? Okay, uh, what we announced is that Punk Rock Raduno number five, which was the edition that was supposed to happen last year, and uh, it was uh, you know postponed to this year, 2021. And what we announced is that Punk Rock Raduno number five is going to happen in 2022. So we postpone again. We have uh, 
the new dates you see the here on the on the streaming you see the logo the logo has the new dates which are july 14 17 2021 and uh, that's the right thing to do because we know that this summer while probably uh, things are gonna get way better we suppose uh, but it's not gonna be uh, as free as um, easy especially for foreign punk rockers to to get here and for foreign bands to get here so what we're yeah. doing is uh, punk raduno number no. five so the, the usual four days of uh, of music and events is gonna move to next year but we have beautiful news uh, anyway because uh, we are working on a mm, second edition of the worst raduno and uh, this is going to happen uh, in mid july this year and it's going to be 3 days of events mostly happening at edone and uh, we're going to have uh, live bands we're going to have uh, people uh, i think how, how many people we can get up to now in edone well, at this moment, 500 people per night, but uh, we are confident we, we are going to, you know, increase to 700 to 800 people capacity. That's so beautiful. Hopefully, hopefully. Very good. <laughs> enough Very to good. have fun. Enough to have yeah, fun. Yeah, that's enough to have fun. Uh, last year, it was fun. It was weird because we were all kind of shocked. For, for what was happening worldwide and uh, for, the, for the moment that we had to face both individually and uh, as a community but uh, we tried last year to, to give a signal of uh, not giving up of still wanting to uh, you know connect with uh, friends and uh, with our favorite music and i think it went well so what we're doing this year france is uh, probably uh another way to put the scene together as we want it to like yeah the same yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a big festival it doesn't we, we don't care about you know selling tickets because the festival is free, it's free. But, exactly. uh, <laughs> what matters is uh, you know uh, keep keeping keeping the scene close keeping yeah. our friends yeah. close to each other I guess people don't realize that we do this, first of all, for ourselves, because we are passionate people and uh, everyone involved in Punk Rock Raduno is a volunteer. So uh, me and Andrea are the faces of it. So many times we speak about it, but the, the real work behind the scenes is done by a really nice group of uh, people and volunteers. And we don't get a dime uh, for Punk Rock Raduno. And, uh, you know, you will start to... Uh, meet them and learn about them uh, hopefully with this twitch channel and uh, if you if you go to shows in italy you know who they are and uh, but yes uh, as you said i think uh, it was important to give a sign you know last even last year when it was most more difficult and uh, it's important to have a sign this year as well of course we consider a punk rock raduno a gather together of international friends you know everyone involved in the scene get it together we know that it's going to be hard to travel this year so we felt better about postponing Raduno to the next year the real Raduno to the next year but still yeah. we don't want to give up and even if what we prefer is having as many people as possible in the <laughs> in the smallest venue as possible in the loudest with the loudest band as possible that's what we normally prefer we we don't do it just because of uh, electric guitar or loud music or fast music we do it because we you know we are based on the do it yourself ethics uh, we are based on the culture and subculture and we felt it's important for us and for to cover th that hole that everyone has inside so uh, and we just don't want to get bored so the, yeah. the good news is that next year Pancor Cartoon of Fire is going to be an incredible incredible fast yeah, and even <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly and this year if you can come 16 17 18th of july 2021 it's going to be three days it's going to be uh, i think is you know people is it's going to be better than what people expect and actually we are going to announce the first band next week same yeah, exactly. time as now with a, with a guest and we are, we are not going to announce the guest, otherwise we ruin the surprise. Yeah, what's going to happen next week is that you're going to see 
uh, as here online and uh, we'll announce the first band just by having uh, one guy from that band popping in into the live streaming. This yes, is what's exactly. Gonna happen next Sunday, and uh, we are working on a very. I just wanted to tell our friends that we are working on a very uh, cool lineup of bands, and uh, some of those are uh, already uh, confirmed. Uh, most of them are confirmed, yeah. and uh, we are very excited because it's coming out pretty, <laughs> pretty good, pretty good lineup. Uh, I mean, that's just my opinion and Franz' opinion, but. Uh, uh, our vision of what uh, a cool show could be uh, are basically the past editions. So in, uh, in that uh, logic, uh, we believe uh, we put together a very good cast for this summer. I'm actually surprised how good it became so far. <laughs> you know, hopefully, no one you know check out and uh, and doesn't come. But yeah. you know, if if uh, you know if things go this way, I'm I'm actually very very happy. Oh. And uh, actually, thanks because we don't thank them enough. Not only about the community, but also the bands. Everyone playing at Punk Rock World Uno, believe me, don't get rich in playing at Punk Rock World Uno or collaborating with us. Actually. <laughs> Probably everyone lose money, I'm but we do it for a good cause. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, we, we are getting, we are gonna, we are getting a lot of messages for Pogodzin, which is gonna be our official fanzine for the Worst Raduno. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And soon uh, you'll be able to to ask questions to our guest, which you already know who is he. So without further ado. I will say, Andrea, I will see you in a, just a little bit. I introduce sure. the guest and then you're going to join. And then because, you know, two stars at the same time is really too much to handle. So I ask you to step back a little bit and we're yeah, going to have sure. the other star. And then it's going to be like apotheosis of coolness and punk rock at the end when uh, you both join together. OK, I'm just here following the interview and uh, I just invited all, all our fans to post uh, questions and comments uh, so that uh, we can, uh, you know, satisfy all our curiosities about Larry's life and, you know, uh, record label. Fantastic. So see you later, Andrea. See you later, Alligator. <laughs> So the star of tonight. <laughs> well, first of all, let's explain why we chosen him as the first guest of the Punk Rock Raduno interviews on Twitch. Well, we are not lying when we tell you we consider Punk Rock Raduno something more than a festival of bands playing live. So we consider there is a culture, there is a philosophy, there is art behind everything we do. And so just to give a sign, we didn't want to invite to a, a band per se you know we wanted to invite someone that embodied the spirit of do it yourself the spirit of what we do a philosopher you know of punk rock and i think we got the best of the best someone well basically is uh is the one the reason why we are all here probably and uh he did many things he comes from detroit uh, city but you probably don't know about that and uh, is the founder of the incredible lookout records is an artist is a writer for you know many magazines maximum rock and roll punk planet he wrote many books and again he released uh, some of the most classic records in uh, you know some of them you see behind me so well i guess you already guessed welcome larry livermore Ciao. Ciao, come uh, stai? Buonasera, Io, uh, prima vorrei de dire to buonasera a uh, tutti i miei amici italiani, uh, francesi, tedeschi, russi, inglesi, americani, canadesi, and all the rest of you as well. I just wanted to get that out of the, of the way because I didn't it, want all my Italian practice to go for nothing. Um, incredible. You, 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 you already speak English better than most of the, my Italian friends. Eh, sorry, speak Italian better than most of I, uh, my Italian I've been practicing English for a long time, and I hope I'm 
almost yeah. as good as the many Italian people I know, but many of them <laughs> do speak very good English. And uh, uh, it's, it's important to me to, uh, uh, to learn a little. I was thinking, uh, I see you sitting on the floor and I saw the poor people, they don't have chairs. You must have, <laughs> you must have a chair. And I don't, this is how my mind works. The next thing I think was I was trying to finish my coffee in a hurry because I, I was thinking of my mother who's no longer with us, but a wonderful woman. And, and if she saw me drinking the coffee on the television while, while we, uh, we were, she would say, that's very rude of you. And then I thought one step further and I thought, my gosh, you know, what would mom say now? She's been only gone a few years, but even in her time, she would never imagine something like uh, Raduno TV, Twitch TV, or what <laughs> yes. we would be talking all over the world. And then I remember some more. She told me the first memory she had on the farmhouse uh, when she was two and a half years old. Of course, there was not even any electricity then. Yeah. And this was only, uh, in fact, it was exactly 100 years ago when she was telling me about uh, in 1921. Uh, she was growing up in a farmhouse in, the, in Canada in the, in the rural area with no electricity, where you had to pump all the water out of the, the ground with a, a bucket and no water in the house. And, and how much things have changed in yes. such a short in such a short time and all of the, you know, both good and horrible things that have happened in that time. And it's, I, I like to keep this in perspective when I, when I talk about culture, when I talk about history, when I talk about anything really. That's beautiful. So, sorry did to make a speech. But no, no, did, did she am. knew about uh, Lookout Records? Like did, 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 uh, did, did she knew about what, what you were doing or, you, you know, it was, Oh, of course, of course she knew she was even she 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 died just before the just three days before she turned 97 and okay. she kept she was very clear headed and she loved to talk about ideas and uh, what I was doing with my life and with my travels. I had just I had just come back from a trip around the world. My first time I had gone all the way around the world mm -hmm. and and. It was kind of sad because uh, she, we were, I was on my way to celebrate her 97th birthday, but first I had to stop on the East Coast of America to do a presentation for my book, uh, okay. how, to, how to Ruin or How to Run a Record Label. And she was disappointed because I, I, she was expecting me to be there that night. Yeah. And I had just finished giving the presentation and it was went very, very well. Many people came. We had a really good discussion and a call from my brother came that she had, had fallen asleep after church and they had taken her to hospital and, and she died shortly afterward. And because I had expected to see her the next day and she was going to come to my next book event, which was at one, two, three, four, go records in, in Oakland, California. Yeah. Beautiful uh, store. Yeah, and it well, it was it was beautiful and, and sad. Be, I, she would have been the oldest person after me at the uh, yeah. second book presentation, but you know, it was just filled with East Bay people, and many of yeah. the people whose records you see behind you uh, were were there to uh, support me. And and I thought, gosh, Mum would really love to to be here and see what all of this work over the years has amounted to but uh, instead I talked about her and said what my background had meant and growing up where I did and how that had affected me and and in turn how it had affected it, it had affected her I mean she came from a you know it it must seem like a very long time ago to to people to young people of today but to me I can almost touch these times from the early 1900s, even the 1800s, because there were many people in my life when I was growing up alive from the 1800s, uh, my mom's relatives. Uh, it's funny, she, she was never, of course, a fan of most of the, the punk rock music, but she was only keenly, always keenly interested 
and you know, cool. she always wanted to ask questions. She met many of the uh, musicians, especially especially Trey from from Green Day. She saw a lot of him from the time he was a child, um, because he was my neighbor when when he was before he became a musician. He already was a small child nearby, and uh, you know she always had something uh, funny to say about him. But nice. <laughs> I, I'm sure she was uh, the, the the father's mom because you know having like a, you know your son to be you know involved with art, uh, being a kind person and a, a literate person because you know you're always learning, you're always you know in the process of uh, you know trying to get better and try to be kind to everyone. I mean, I, she must have been very very happy about uh, what you did uh, and uh, also you know look at records let's let's face it in a way or another you know really impacted impacted the pop culture you know it became you know what you did impacted the mainstream and and changed many lives like mine you know if you if you didn't did what what you did you know <laughs> probably my life will be you know different for sure but i'm pretty sure i'm happy to say that uh, it would have been worse. And uh, I guess many of the, the the people following this and that will watch this will agree with this. So I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I didn't, of course, your, your mom, but I'm pretty sure, you know, she was, you know. Uh, she was still reading, she was still reading a, a couple hours a day of different books right up till the day she died. And she was very keen to know about everything. It's funny though, my, my father, was the opposite when I told him his very famous quote when I said, oh, I started a record label and I, I think I have this band of teenagers that I think are going to do really well. I was talking about Green Day, of course. And he said, well, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> so well, from yeah. then on until he passed away, I would always, whenever I had a new idea or a new band, I would always tell him about it, hoping that he would say, that's a stupid idea because I thought that would be good luck. Yes, yes, well, you know, so Larry, uh, first question, uh, there has been a lot of, you no, know, I, talking. I, I, stop. Oh, I, just, I know this is very unprofessional. Don't worry. I just got a message from my good Italian friend, Stefano Morello, mm -hmm. right now, inviting me to come to the park with him, and I just have to send him uh, a message right back to say I'm on TV now. Yeah, yes, kind, kind of TV. He was he yeah, was yeah. at Raduno when when uh, I attending remember. the event at the uh, at the bicycle. How do you call it? The bicycle uh, cafe. It's called the Bike Fellas, and I'm glad to say, Fellas. even if the times were hard, it's a beautiful place, and it's going to reopen soon. and And I think that moment that you 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 came to Aduno, and uh, you know, many of, of people coming to Aduno don't know about it, but it's not that you know you came to Aduno and introduced yourself. It's, it's not that we know we we were looking for your stuff. You know, you you. You really know what's going on, you know. You wrote me and said, "Like, hey, I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming things. to Aduno." I know and, uh, about some things. I don't know anything about other things. I'm very famous for not knowing about many cultural mm. things that people a bit younger know all about, and they laugh at me a lot. Do you do you uh, do you have the candy called? Um, I can't even think of their name now. Uh, Skittles. Do you know that candy? Yeah. Yes, we do that. Yeah, uh, we have that. Well, it became a big thing in America a few years ago when I said, what are Skittles? Because I did had no idea, and everybody just laughed at me and thought I was making it up that I never heard of them. But but it is true. <laughs> I, never, I never have had them. I didn't even know what they were. Um, it is. It is. Yes. So... <laughs> Go ahead. I, see, Ryan, I interrupted you in the middle of a question. No, no, don't worry. Don't worry. I, I, I'm sorry for your friend that we are going to steal you because we have so many questions and more questions are he coming. He should be watching. This is, what I, this is what I was... Exactly, exactly. Why does he not know? <laughs> what, what, what kind of friend that he doesn't know that you're on TV right now? So This is what I'm saying, yes. And he's my neighbor but, also here in New York. Lately, you know... I follow the Lookout Zoom Out, the beautiful Lookout Zoom Out event, uh, 
done by Grant Lawrence, and those were great. And then uh, I saw many documentaries about, you know, the punk scene in the 90s, about, you know, Gilman Street, about Green Day, the early years. It seems like Lookout Records and those bands, you know, they are still really re relevant today. You know, there is still a lot of interest. There is a lot of people that talks about it, and there is a lot of people that put their hearts in those bands. I think Punk Rock Waduno, at least the, the basic of our festival, is still based on that, you know, I don't want to say nostalgia, but, you know, of that scene. So why do you think is that? You know, do you think it's just a nostalgic uh, memory that people want to relieve his past or, or stuff like that? Or do you think there is something connected to that scene and that way of doing things that is still relevant today? So why... Why there is still so many people you think uh, that talk about Lookout Records? Um, two reasons that I can think of. One not so great and one pretty great. Um, pe but people often get mad at me still when I express my opinion. I think for a certain number of people of a, of a certain age, you know, that music is always going to be most uh, is, is going to be important because they were teenagers when they first heard it and it, it, it came out when they were having all the big adventures of growing up, you know, uh, first, first love, first, uh, first concert, first all. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same for many people my age when they think about the, uh, the music from the 19, early 1960s, <laughs> you know, the doo-wop music and the Motown music and, uh, and then the, the Beatles. I mean, the, many people, most people my age, are they still listen to that and say, yeah. these young people, they don't know anything about good music. It's very tedious. In fact, many people my age, it's hard to talk with them because they only want to talk about how their music is better and the young people today don't know anything about music. But the other reason I would like to think, and I don't know, if, I think only time will, will tell about this, I think because at least some of the music we did will last a long time, maybe forever, at least as long as there is music and a way to hear it. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't pretend to know which, of, of, of which forms of, or which particular bands or records will, will be, become almost immortal, but mm -hmm. I, I feel pretty confident that at least some of the stuff that we worked with will will do that, and um, you know certainly Operation Ivy and Green Day, their their legacy is going to be around for a very long time, and maybe many years from now people will be playing some kind of idea, some kind of music that was inspired by and not even know where it came from, just yeah. like. You know, when I got involved in, in music, I didn't realize it, but I was influenced by the pop music that I heard as a child. And the pop music I heard as a child was, this will sound funny, but from the 90s, but I mean the 1890s, because that's what my, that's what my parents and their parents listened to was, is, is, it's the very first pop music, really, because before that, uh, working class people didn't, have enough money to support their own kind of music and mm -hmm. so so basically there was only there there was the high foot the high class opera for for kings and nobles and rich people and there was folk music the kind that the farmers and the factory workers would sing as they did their work but there was no way of recording it because this is the 1800s yep. but 1890s it was called Believe it or not, the gay 90s, but the gay meant something different and that it just meant happy and uh, fun. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that they began to uh, um, have popular music that was for ordinary people that didn't have a lot of money. Yeah, and my dad was telling me about this and I said, but dad, how did you listen to music? How did you have popular music when you had no record player and you had no radio? Because when he was growing up, this was before radio and record player. Oh, he said, it's very simple because every Friday night, the sheet music would come from New York with the new songs and they would come to the dime store in our town and we would wait down there and we would, we would buy the new songs and we would take it to somebody's house who had a piano and they would learn how to play the new song. And then that night we would all come and have a party and sing the new hit song. And this was how 
they heard pop music for the yep. first un, until the 1920s when they began to have radio. And, and then and later after that, uh, working people could afford, begin to afford record players. But my dad grew up listening to this pop music from the 1890s style, but it was very, very melodic. And it was, you know, the, the, the rich people used to go, that stuff is just trash for common people. But I loved it because it was singing about normal stuff that normal people knew. And it had such good choruses, such good melodies. You just couldn't, you just could not sing along with it. And even from when I was only four years old, I was five years old, I was already singing along with those kind of a song. And when I got involved in, in music and punk music many years later, you know, I when I, I was attracted right away to the to the melodies and the choruses and to the songs that told a story about what life was like for just regular working in ordinary well i don't i want to say ordinary because that kind of diminishes i mean the people who make the world go round you know the, yes. billions, the billions of them and that's what i connected with and i it took many years but i realized all along when i picked the bands that i wanted to work with when i decided who to make records with it was always those kind of of bands yeah yeah that, that that's kind, exactly that yeah a good definition of what uh, you know the the, the lookout bands uh, uh, you know, was talking about and the good melody and uh, you know talking about the people that make the the, the world go around. It. That's the perfect it's, definition. It's also a good definition of pop music and pop punk. Mm -hmm. I get so many people say, "Oh, pop punk is just trash. That's just garbage." And I was like, "If you don't like pop, then then you don't like people because because <laughs> pop is short." As you know, in Italian, for popoli, pop for people, and popular yes. and and of course. is this is the same word. It just it means you don't like pop, you don't like people. Is my is yeah. my is my way of looking at it. No, no, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, so let's go into the the details about Lookout Records. Like I have this discussion many times, and I want to know your opinion about it. You know, because there is a lot of people looking back at the Lookout that you know t tend to have a specific idea of what lookout records was and a specific idea of a sound of lookout records which to me is a little bit uh, crazy because in particular in italy you know everyone tend to think like even in newspapers or music magazines now you know punk rock look lookout style is something connected to mostly the queers screeching weasel and uh, mr t experience while to me, you know, at least as a fan, maybe I had the same idea when I was 14, but then discovering the catalog and what you were really doing is not a label about a sound, but a label with many sounds and a label with an idea behind it, you know, which is what a lot of people still, you know, fail to understand sometimes. So what's your opinion about it? And does this... You know how these make you feel. Like what? What your idea about the lookout? Uh, I would say there was something immediately identifiable about the what I guess you could call the the classic lookout, um, but it was not so much the sound. Well, one way it was the sound because we didn't have hardly any money back then, and so everything had to be made very quickly and very cheaply. So there was a certain type of sound that just sort of thrown together, kind of like a fanzine that you just type it up on a, and, and Xerox it. But more than a sound, it was a feel. Uh, a feeling, uh, you, many of those early record, Lookout records, you could almost tell right away that it was Lookout, there we, no matter what kind of music the band was playing. Just, it, it, it didn't, just, just from the, the whole package, the way the, the the art was very uh, kind of thrown together. The the way it was, it was, it was like just really, uh, you know, like a bunch of kids getting together in their in their uh, in their basement or their attic and saying, "Let's have a record label." And <laughs> it, it had it had that feel. And interestingly, naming the name the band, the bands you named that most get identified with the so called lookout pop punk song. 
sound, most of them did not even come to Lookout until several years after we started, yeah. like the yeah, early 90s. Uh, al already, I mean, the first bands on Lookout beginning in 1987, there was a, we had Operation Ivy, not sounding at all like the Queers or Screeching Weasel. We had Corrupted Morals. We had Sticky, the Yeasty Girls, Acapella, a feminist rap, uh, you know, many different kinds of sounds and uh, and many different kinds of ideas. But yeah, it was more it was more of a of a feeling, and and people did relate to that more than pe people would would buy the records without even hearing them, just because they thought, well, this is Lookout, and it kind of is the label that I relate to. Yeah, and the the other interesting thing is that. You started, and I really connect with this. You started from a magazine, from a fanzine, and then because you realized that you know you were able to do the fanzine, you could also do the record label. Like Lookout Records started as a fanzine, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Although I, I, I used to, uh, Aaron Kamapos used to always refer to Lookout Magazine as a, a fanzine, and I would get really annoyed and say, "It's not a fanzine; it's a zine," because I'm yeah. not a fan of anything. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, Lookout Magazine did start as just four four pages of Xerox with fifty copies that I just gave away for free. But it grew to at its peak ten thousand printed copies. Wow! And well, yeah, uh, a real I mean, a big magazine. Actually. Yeah. Oh, it was, the funny thing was I originally started the the lookout magazine because I got angry with the uh, the newspaper in my little village where near where I lived in the mountains because they I created so much controversy with writing angry letters to the to the editor about local issues that they refused to print any more of my letters so wow. I said well fine I will just start my own magazine and that created controversy too but by the nineties my magazine had gotten much, much bigger than <laughs> than the newspaper, and it was read all over, not just America, but even in many parts of the world. So I was, I was, uh, I have to say, I did make my peace with the people at the newspaper eventually too. And <laughs> even, even they acknowledged that I wasn't all bad. I oh, wonder anyway, about yeah, you mentioned the question of yeah, it, it became pretty obvious that. Well, to me anyway, I don't know if it makes sense to anybody else that if I could just Xerox a bunch of pages and start reaching people all over the world, well, why couldn't they do the same with records? And now there was, you know, obviously many differences, but I was naive enough, ignorant enough to not know that there was many differences. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll just make a bunch of records and they'll go all over the world too. I always wonder about this question, like one of the great points about Lookout Records is the fact that you really documented a scene, you know, the East Bay punk, at least originally, and many of those bands grew or changed and became popular because of the, you know, your help, because of the fact that you put them, you gave them a chance, you know. So in retrospect, how important is for a scene in general to have the chance to do a record? You know, for example, do you think without you offering to Operation Ivy or to Green Day to do their first record, do you think those bands would have done what they, they've done or that the scene would have grown in that way? Because, you know, that's an important part. I mean, I, I wonder sometimes how many beautiful scenes there are in the world that maybe they don't got lucky enough to have a Larry Livermore, you know, or someone that started a label or a fanzine or a magazine. It's impossible to say what would have happened. Uh, I, I get asked that a lot, but it's really impossible to, to even guess what would have happened to some of those bands if there wasn't a lookout. It's certainly very possible that somebody else would have started a label and they would have got just as big or maybe even bigger. It's also possible that they would have got frustrated because nobody heard them. And, you know, I did see that happen to many bands where they didn't find a good outlet for their records or they, or they found a, 
a label that was very bad that cheated them and then they got so discouraged that they gave up music but i would like to correct this idea i did not set out to document the east bay or the california punk scene I mean, mm -hmm. it, in a way that definitely did happen. And I was writing about it even before I started making records. But I was, again, covering a culture. It, it just happened because, you know, communication, there was no internet back then, of course. And communication between the, the different cities and countries was not what it is today. So yeah. it was only natural that, all the bands that I worked with at first were just in the neighborhood, basically. <laughs> um, but I, I feel, I felt then without knowing the words for it, and I feel more strongly now, what I was really trying to, to document was a culture, and that was worldwide. And yeah. um, I think that is a, a transformation that has happened during my lifetime, that we have gone from very local to globale global globale yes. italian word yeah it's a, um maybe i maybe i don't i won't live this long but i bet you there are people young enough who are watching this right now who will live to see the day when we will see culture going to other from other from our two other planets to you know that it will no longer just be planet earth and uh, i know that sounds a little crazy now but it, like I was trying to explain about if I had sought, known my mother a hundred years ago and tried to explain to her what was going to happen to her son, you know, in the 21st century, she would have said, oh, you're making stuff up. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's nonsense. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess we, we learned that with the with, with the pandemic as well, you know, how fast and quick things change and take a turn that you, you will never, you know, expect. But... Uh, I my show father, you one my thing. My father was in the last pandemic in 1918. Yeah, well, he almost he almost died in that one. If he, if they saved him at the last minute, or else we would not be having this conversation. Hmm. So, I show you one thing because this uh, this week we are going to celebrate this. I show you. We probably never saw this one. This one is. We were lucky enough, you know, Bergamo, my city, the city of Pancor Quaduno, you visited here, has been really hit hard by the, 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 the pandemic. And uh, it just happened that, uh, for, for crazy combination of things, that uh, one of your former artists, like Team Time Bomb uh, of Operation Ivy and Rancid, donated us some songs and uh, let us release this, uh, uh, you know, uh, seven inch to raise money for the hospital in Bergamo when we they really needed it and that uh, this was a huge success and this just came from the sky and uh, you know I think the sky. You, you know you know it just I happened think, you know I think it came from Los Angeles from Los Angeles yes but uh, you know I just want to talk about people connected to Lookout Records because you know I don't think it's a case that you know someone that started you know, in the East Bay punk scene, and that is probably one of the, you know, most famous uh, rock artists in the in the nineties, I guess, and uh, probably, uh, you know, rich enough uh, that uh, is reaching out and doing this, you know, for the punk community and for you know for a community that is suffering. So I just wanted to know if you knew about this and two words on Tim in general. No, uh, it, it is it is news to me, but it is. Uh very inspiring and and tim is a very inspiring person you know i've known him since uh oh maybe 35 years now at least since since before operation ivy and uh it's uh it's a funny thing about this guy because a lot of people like to make fun of him or pick on him and it, and it always makes me kind of angry when they do that um do you have this expression? It's a Latin expression, but I don't know if they use it in Italian. Sui, sui generis or sui generis. It means of its own type. It's not a, 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 it's not a kind or a style. It's just there's only Absolutely. one kind. And yes. if there was anybody ever that that term applied to, it would, it would be Tim Armstrong or Lint, as I once knew him, or Tim Timebomb, Tim Timebomb as he's often known now. Yeah. 
because he's just there's there's just nobody anything like him, and yet because he has an unusual way of talking and dressing and carrying himself, people criticize and make fun. And and I know when he was young, he used to be very sensitive to that. I think I, I hope after all these years, he's probably got a pretty tough skin because he has just carried on all these years doing whatever came into his heart and to his mind. And because of that, he has become a great artist. He's not just the guy that used to be in that cool band or the guy who's in the cool band now. He's, he's the guy who has done countless things and influenced countless people and helped people. It's just like, you know, a lot of people can say, oh, it's so terrible what has happened in, in Italy with the epidemic. You know, that that little record you hold in your hand, that actually does something to help. That, I'm sure that created real financial help and support. Oh, yeah. both, both not just, you know, the money will help a lot, but also the message will help a lot. And, you know, Tim is one of those rare individuals who, and this will sound funny, but because like my mom, even though my mom never had a beard, but, uh, <laughs> but he is like, he is like her in the sense that he didn't just say, okay, well, when I was in my twenties, I made these great records. So now I'll just relax. No, he's going, he's spending the rest of his life continually learning and doing new things. You know, when he was already well along in his life, he took up art he uh and and was very good at it i think he probably designed the uh the cover of that record yeah yeah he did uh and and also you know unlike many musicians he plays music purely for the love of it i mean obviously he's done very well in the commercial realm by with his big bands but you know a lot of people know about tim timebomb who makes all these different sessions with all these different musicians. A lot of what they play is just old folk songs or old blues songs or classic rock song. They just get together and play it and maybe make a, a video or a, a, a record or a, a tape. And just for, I mean, it's not to make money. I'm sure it doesn't make much money, if any, but just for the love of music. And, you know, when I first knew him, he mostly just, he mostly just played punk and ska. Since that time, he has explored, I couldn't even begin to name all the different types of, of music that he has worked with. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a very uh, largely self-educated person. Uh, he didn't, I don't think he, I think he may have just about finished uh, high school, but I don't think he went beyond that ever. And yet he's extremely well read. He, all of this, he's just, uh, said you know punk rock has given him an opportunity to explore life in all of its different manifestations and instead of just kicking back and saying okay i'm a rock star now he did it he, he went out there and learned and continues to learn I, like i say a real inspiration and i hope that he's an inspiration for many other musicians because not all musicians do that many of them just say okay i, I have enough money now so i can just uh party or i can just go out and play every year on tour and play the exact same songs that i've been playing for 30 years already to the exact same audience only they're 30 years older nothing wrong with that it's a job it's, but it, to me it reminds me of when i was young working in the factory on the assembly line and, you know on the in the automobile factory it was the same part every day the same parts come down the line and we move them and we drill holes in them and put them in and nothing ever changes. And there are people who treat music that way. Yeah, I see. Who they found, they catch, they find a sound that is popular and they keep playing it and playing it and playing it and will probably do that until they can no longer play anymore. And that's just, it's just a job. I used to, uh, I used to be very disillusioned when I first started meeting uh, professional musicians when I was mm -hmm. maybe a, oh, a long time ago, but I expected them to be all these magical beings that were superpowers and a lot of them were i were just like the the guys i knew in the factory only they had guitar cases instead of lunch pails 
But other than that, they didn't have there wasn't they weren't that that different. But luckily, I did get to meet some people that were not like that. That were just like every day in music and culture and art is a new adventure and, and new worlds to be explored. And you know, Tim Tim is one of those people. Yeah, what really surprised me about him and that you can feel, and I think it's also the reason why a lot of people connect a lot with Rancid. And uh, a lot of people in my city in particular, like we have this long history of, you know, Rancid fanatics and stuff, is that you can really feel, even we, when we did this, the passion he puts in this stuff, you know, just a pure passion that, you know, you could find in a 16 years old pe person that just discovered punk rock and uh, change it his life you know is uh it, it really feels like talking to your best friend or you know doing something that with someone that just live for the music it doesn't matter if he's gonna be you know millionaire or he's gonna be you know it, it seems like he, he will do the same thing no matter what i think uh one thing about rancid and what well, you hear a lot of of punk bands and and oi bands and this who like to portray themselves like, oh, we're working class, uh, we're street punk and stuff. But a lot of them are not. Uh, they are just middle class kids who like that style of music. But with Rancid, they genuinely are working class. That's how they grew up. And it's something I relate to because I also, where I grew up, it was all, everybody was factory workers. And yeah. we did not have big expectations or dreams when, when something out of the ordinary happened, we were like, whoa, that's because we we thought that being a, a star or being famous, that was something that happened to people from the other side of town. But this was an interesting thing that happened at Lookout because some of the mu musicians, many of the musicians I worked with were in fact working class. In fact, many of the people who built Gilman and made that scene were working class kids. But there were others who were better off, and many of them did great things also, but many of them did not have the same commitment. To them, it was just like, oh, this looks like fun. Let's have a band. Let's have a club. Uh, the ones who pretty much stuck with it for life tended to be the working class kids, the ones who never dreamed growing up that they could have something special or above and beyond the, the existence they knew. So when that possibility opened up, they went for it for all it was worth. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, I, all the time that I was running lookout and working with all the different bands, it was something that, uh, you know, it was, I didn't like to be too swayed by it, but it, 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 hap it happened. Like I could, I could relate better to the, to the bands, to the musicians who came from the same kind of background that I did. You know, I, 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 the way I see it, I narrowly escaped being on the assembly line in the, in the auto factory for my whole life. My dad used to say, oh, you should have stayed there at the, at the, at the factory. You, would, you could retire now with a, good living, with a good pension. And I'm like, yeah, but dad, <laughs> I, had, I, I had a different life. It worked out okay. And he said, yeah, but <laughs> you know, Ronnie across the street, he's retired now and he's doing good. <laughs> you know, that was, you know, that was his, and, you know, he was working class background too. And his idea yeah. was you just do your job and get a pension. And yeah. don't expect anything else. And I guess some of us were really, were really blessed and really fortunate to get to do other things beyond what we were led to expect as children. Uh, talking about the well-educated punks, like I noticed that a lot of Lookout Records artists became like teachers or professors. Is that true? Like, is, you know, the... it's very true. In fact, I, I. The last time I counted, I think there were at least 11 or 12 former uh, Lookout Records musicians, artists, whatever, that, that are now professors at different universities. Wow. And they, I don't know why that is for sure, other than, well, maybe because our scene developed in a university town, but many of the people who went on to have careers in the academic world were not from academic backgrounds. Some were, but many weren't. Um, the, the funny thing was uh, that if I 
had not, if my life had not got all messed up and crazy and all whatever, when I was a, a child, I was planning to be a teacher too. Okay. Uh, because I, I was not always good at school. I got into trouble a lot. Um, be uh, uh, So it never happened. And in fact, I wasn't even very good at the factory. So <laughs> I was basically homeless by the time I was in my early 20s. I'm not basically, I was homeless. Uh, so I didn't become a teacher. Uh, I still kind of wish I had. I still envy, I envy people who teach at universities or high schools. I would love to do that. It's probably a little bit late in life, but if somebody offers me a job, I would do it right away, uh, being a teacher. Um, and so it's ironic, but kind of makes me feel good to see that so many people I worked with when they were kids are now professors and teachers themselves. Uh, I'd like to just stop for a second. One of your, uh, one of the w people who's watching had a question about why Billy Joe Armstrong yeah. did it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to hide a second because I just wanted okay. to tell you, in a way, you are, you know, our biggest teacher. <laughs> you know, and actually, then I want to also ask you another thing about okay. something you thought about uh, another artist. Uh, I want to connect with this about passion people and working class people. Do you think it worked the same way with Billy Joe Armstrong and what he's doing now with the Green Day and his, you know, Billy Joe Armstrong as well is starting, you know, this uh, side project with his uh, son and he's doing, you know, these covers, uh, albums and, uh, you know, having fun playing the records, having fun having, uh, you know, side projects. Uh, it seems like for the same reason, just because he's an artist and he, he loves music. Billy Joe Armstrong is just like the other Armstrong, even though they're <laughs> not related by blood. He, he's also from a very working class background. Um, his family, because his father died when he was young, they struggled a lot to, to get by. And his mother supported all these children with, with a, a, a waitress's job. So he too, I don't think he ever dared to dream of, well, he did dream about being a musician someday like his father was. I don't think he ever expected what happened. And so I, I think also he, he too is somebody who treasures this opportunity that he has been given. And, and the same is actually true of his, of his, of his uh, musical partner, Mike and, and, and Trey also. Um, those, so uh, yeah, I think that those are all good examples of, of musicians that, uh, that just really didn't didn't dare to dream that they would have such opportunities, but made the most of them and, and continue even now that they're approaching 50 years old uh, are continuing to make the most of. But it's an interesting uh, dichotomy. I've, I've often remarked on this. Now, both of those bands, uh, Operation Ivy and, and Green Day, they had one member who was from a... Uh, not rich, but a little bit more middle class background, and both of them quit. And you know, I'm talking <laughs> about the first drummer from Green Day and uh, and Jesse the singer from, from Operation Ivy. They both, you know, they were they're they're both extremely talented, smart people. But because I think this is my theory, I may be full of it, but my theory is because they were from a little bit more middle class background, they had this feeling like, oh, I can do this or I can do that. I can try different things uh, because middle-class families, they tend to tell their children, you can do anything that you want, anything you dream of, and we'll help you. Whereas with working class families, they say, you better hang on to whatever you get and be grateful that you got it. This is what I got from my family too. They would say I was crazy, insane to give up something. And this is what, uh, you know, I feel like it made the difference between, you know, the, the, the musicians who were from a more working class background, they're like, wow, you mean I get to make records and go around and do shows and people will even give me enough money I can live on? This is like the best thing in the world. Yeah. And people from a little bit more middle class background, well, yeah, it's great fun being in a band and I love it, but I think maybe I'll try something else for a while. And, you know, in the case of both, uh, you know, John or Al from uh, Green Day, he's got a great career now, but in a completely different field. 
Yep. And and Jesse has become a you know both he's a, what they call a, a renaissance man. He's a, he does art, he does music, he he does he's a a philosopher of sorts. He's 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 written books. He's just you know he does all sorts, but he he felt free to explore everything. Um, I see. The guys, the other guys in the band are like, wow, we got a good band. Let's make it work. Keep, yeah, yeah, let's stay together. But, well, going back to the question you are referring to, my friend Simone, who is actually the guy that put me, in, that make this happen? He's the guy. So he's asking, uh, do you know what went wrong with Billy Joe Armstrong, who was uh -huh. in the verge to join Rancid before Lars got in the band? This is kind I, I of don't, gossip. I don't, I don't think went wrong is the right question uh unless of course you're somebody who thinks rancid is the best band ever in the history of the world and green day is not important at all um because the to me they are both very good bands but in many different in, in different ways the story about uh about billy and green and uh rancid is very simple actually uh for a while there was a kind of an argument about whether Rancid needed a, a, a second guitar player or not, but they finally sort of agreed that they did because Tim liked to sing so much also that sometimes he would forget to play guitar while he was singing. And uh, it, it still was a good show, but it, it they felt like another second guitar would, 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 would make it a lot more solid. And I mean, I'm, I was the op opposite side, to be honest. In fact, I was saying, no, you know, no, you're great like you are. You don't need another guitar player. Uh, but they, as usual, they ignored my advice because <laughs> they, Operation Ivy was the same. They, I would give advice and they would say, okay, thanks for the advice. We're going to do what we decided. Um, but they started looking around for guitarists. And it wasn't so much like Billy was going to be necessarily in the band it was like let's just try it let let's just play a show with a uh, an extra guitarist and billy was like you know billy back then would play with you know anybody that asked him he would you know they would play with corrupted morals he played on uh on, on the last lookouts recording session did a, a bunch of songs and sang with us um but they liked how he sounded with Rancid and they said, yeah, we, we like it. We, you can join our band. You know, why don't you? He said, yeah, well, it would be fun, but I kind of got another band going too. And, and that of course was Green Day and they were starting to get really, you know, they were starting to make some real progress. I, I not sure if this was before or after Kerplunk came out, but once Kerplunk came out, there was no doubt in anybody's mind that Green Day were going to be a very big band. So I don't I don't think it was ever really a serious possibility that Billy was going to be uh, a permanent part of Rancid. It would it would be kind of like Mike uh, from Green Day when he went to record with Screeching Weasel on that on yeah. that one album. It was never any serious idea that he was going to be a permanent member member of Screeching Weasel. It was just yeah, it was just it was not practical or possible. I mean, right, right, right around that same time he recorded on that record, they they were beginning to play for a hundred thousand people at at the like at like the Boston uh, show that turned into a riot. I mean, it was yeah. just not it was just not going to happen. When do you see those bands, like in particular Green Day, and what they are doing now, and how much they influenced, you know? Uh, culture and music and in general and what they are still doing because they are still relevant how do you feel do you feel proud like how do you see them now like from your perspective um it's not i i would be it would be really arrogant and foolish of me to feel proud i mean because i didn't write the songs i didn't sing the songs <laughs> i didn't do the work of setting up the tours and all all that nobody when all those hundreds of thousands of people came to see those bands, they didn't come to see me. So I don't know. I, I you know, would like to think I had some part in helping them along the way to get to where they got, but it would be really dumb of me to take too much or any credit, really. Uh, you know, you can always ask questions like, would they have gotten the attention they did if I hadn't put out their records? 
you know, you know, nobody knows. It's impossible to say. But I, I would say in, in some ways it's a little bit like uh, being a parent or a grandparent. I mean, you, you see your children, your grandchildren go out into the world and do things. Sometimes they may do really great, amazing things, discover great scientific breakthroughs. Sometimes they may become serial killers or the, the worst person in the world. You know, what would you do, for instance, if you were, if you were Hitler's parents? Would you say, well, that's my son. Would you say it's my fault? But at the same time, what if you say your like your son turns out to be like the or your daughter turns out to be like the the greatest most wonderful person ever? Again, did you do that? I don't know, maybe maybe you helped them. Maybe they did it in spite of you. Maybe they did it to, because they think you're such a jerk that they're going to go out and do wonderful things <laughs> in opposition to what you told yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> so good good answer very good way and and but i i think you're way too humble sometimes about this i mean of course you know you 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 influence this thing in my my perspective but one thing like i love this book this Thank is your you. second book is the second part of your history i'm sure you're writing the third one which is gonna slowly you know, but painfully sure yes it's being written it's about half done right now so in this one you basically cover uh, the whole experience at Lookout Records. And there is one thing that really impressed me because you can combine both the personal aspect and the history of the label and how the, the label operated. And uh, to my, my conclusion about this is that the fact that you left the label was uh, because in particular facing the, the consequences of uh, its uh, you know success. Because from one side, you basically, you know, the, the bands that you, you launched, like Green Day or, you know, the, the, the post-Operation Ivy and stuff, that started to have this big success and punk in general started to be, you know, on the mainstream and stuff. And then with success, it comes uh, expectations. And mm -hmm. uh, I always tend to think that expectations is what normally kills art, creativity, but in particular rock bands. You know, because when you expect, when you set the expectation too high, you tend to focus on those expectations and then you forget about all the passion, all the making music, all the stuff. Is it, did they understood well? Because it feels like the expectation of your own bands, you know, of not your own, but, you know, of the bands on the label also caused the fact that, you know, everything suddenly was not as... Uh, you know, fun and, uh, you know, family oriented and stuff, uh, community oriented stuff with us before. Somebody uh, once said to me that expectations are resentments and disappointments in, in embryo. Uh, <laughs> yes. And yeah. It, and I, I only under, this was many years after lookout and I, I really understood it then. I, I wouldn't have understood it if you told me back in the early days. But one of the things that made Lookout special in the early days was that there were no expectations. It's true. We uh, never dreamed that we would sell hundreds of thousands of records or millions of records. However, this is the, something that set me apart from most. And, and in fact, it, it was a big conflict with my first partner, David Hayes, who, who helped, um, helped. I mean, without him, there would have been no Lookout in the beginning because he knew how to do many things that I like especially art that I didn't know anything about. Um, but he, he did not, he wanted to be like the kind of punk that says, Oh, now we'll, we're, we'll never sell very many records. All, you know, nobody sell, you know, punks never are successful. And I was more like, let's just be open to the possibility of, you know, if, if only 100 people want to buy our records, then we'll make a hundred. If 100 million people want to buy them, then we'll make a hundred million. It doesn't make any difference. It's it's just it's it's whatever whatever kind of reception we get, we'll work with that. Um, and I think that's a big part of what made Lookout so special in the early years is we were just completely open to all possibilities. There were no expectations of being big or small or anything else. Um, the the time that you period the period that you talk about with the expectations it was mostly on the part of 
other other bands and people they were like oh this is a big thing now this lookout if i get hooked up with it then i will become rich and famous um it was not something that was important to me i was trying to keep to the original philosophy but i was getting a lot of pressure from people that say oh make if you don't if you don't sign me to your label you're ruining my career you're ruining my life how, how could you do that especially if you're my friend what kind of friend are you if you don't you know give me a job or a, a record on your label and that was never how i chose records or people to work with it was always this fits together um however the you know my leaving look at when i did i have to be very honest and firm with myself and have to admit it was a big feeling on my part the reason that i let myself be affected so much by these pressures was because i lacked assurance you know i would, I would this will it would like i would like to think maybe it was partly because of my again my working class background where we never expected any success to happen and mm -hmm. my dad especially always said well even if you get somewhere the the rich people will, and the government will take it away from you uh, i had this kind of negative attitude and um i i gave up too easily i did i did not stick strongly enough to my principles there are certain people and certain bands i should have just said well, go on then. I don't, you know, if you don't love Lookout, don't love being part of this scene, then we don't need to be together. You know, you just go find some other way. Uh, instead, I became a coward and walked away from it rather than have more trouble. Now, I'm not saying that that was for better or worse. My life took many turns as afterwards, and I think my life has become a very good life ever since Lookout. And you will hopefully read about this in the in the third book because that's what i cover but i also cover you know why i failed you know for for 10 years i had a lot of success with lookout then i feel like i i failed because of, of personal you know weaknesses and things that i didn't know or didn't understand well enough and these this is what i do want to get into in some depth in the in the in the third book but um, I think I, I, uh, you know, sometimes I, I regret, well, that I left. Uh, certainly I would have a lot more money today if I had stayed. And <laughs> certainly I, I, maybe this will sound arrogant, but I'm pretty sure Lookout would still exist today if, uh, if I had stayed, um, I don't know what form it would be in, but I, I would like to think it would still be a, a good, successful label. But I just was not able. I, I was in a state of mind and a state of consciousness at that time that I just was not able to do it. But ultimately, yeah, I gave up. I gave up too easily. I did not solve my personal problems that I needed to solve. And I, I remember writing in that book that you mentioned, I say, I, I felt at the time that if I stayed, that if I didn't leave, I, it would kill me. And it might have. I was very, very depressed, very, you know, self-destructive by that point. And it's, it's, it's too bad. But, you know, I can't, I can't uh, you know, blame the circumstances or bands or people other than myself because, you know, there are many other people who were involved in the scene at that time who are still involved and who are still, you know, they didn't give up. They kept going and they still are producing great art and doing great stuff. So I can't, I can't put the blame on anyone other yeah. than myself ultimately, which is not being, I don't think too, too humble or anything. It's just how it is. We, we all make mistakes and if, if uh, we're if we're smart, we try to learn from them and, uh, and move on to the next phase of our life, and that's what I that's what I've tried to do. It's been, gosh, almost you know, 24 years since I left Lookout, and a lot of stuff has happened, yeah. and my life has gotten better and better. But I do I do mostly regret, and I mean I 
terribly regret that by leaving when I did that a lot of bands that I had brought to look out and said, I will take care of you, that they, they got left behind and that the, the, um, you know, that, that part I feel terrible about and I don't, you know, luckily a lot of them have gone on to find another way to get their music heard. But, uh, you know, I've gone around. That, that is one thing that really impressed me of your book about this feeling at the end that everything suddenly, you know, there is money coming in and then expectation of every band gets higher and higher. And then this, everything is on you, you know, suddenly you are like the, the one to blame or the one to ask to, or the one everyone had expectations on. And um, I remember you talk about, you know, suddenly when uh, after you left, the joke we are calls you and say like, hey, we, we are not getting paid since, uh, you know, so long or the things are not uh, good enough. Or, and I also remember, you know, the, 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 the region you mentioned here, the moment you decide to, to quit uh, Lookout Records. So did so many people change and the bands change their behave or their expectation when suddenly money came in? You, you know, you, you saw a lot of your friends, uh, you know, turning on you or stuff like that, like everything was suddenly heavy. Um, some did and some didn't. And that's, uh, odd. strangely enough, the, the bands who were making the best music and who were the most successful, most of them did not change at all. Uh, all of the years after Green Day had and Rancid had gone on to big success, they never made any problems. They never, uh, never complained. They were happy that Lookout was continuing to keep their records in print and continuing to pay them. One of the keys to Lookout's success is that we always paid everybody on time right away. I mean, never, never a delay. And that was very unusual for an independent label. Um, you know, Joe Queer is a good example. That guy, uh, you know, he never really uh, cared about money much at all. I mean, to the point where I would always, Joe, you got to take a little bit more care of your business or you're going to be sorry in the future. And you go, ah, be fine. I'll just play some more shows. Um, and so it was, uh, you know, he would have, I'm sure that if I had stayed at Lookout, he would have stuck around forever and uh, keep, keep doing, you know, keep playing music. Uh, it's funny, but, uh, you know, when Rancid started to get really big and Madonna came was came to their show trying to sign them, and I was at one of their, their very first really big shows, and I was backstage, and, and Matt from the, uh, from, from Rancid uh, introduced me to some of the, other, I don't know, big industry musician type types. And he said, oh, yeah, this is Larry. He's He put out our first record with Operation Ivy. He's still paying uh, me uh, royalties every every three months. It's great. I use it for cat food. Uh, and I, I got kind of angry at the time because it was quite a bit more than cat food. But I realized that, it, you know, to what Rancid was doing then, eh, it, was, it was almost like it was this – it was a small amount of money, but he was teasing me, but he was he was grateful that I had kept He was appreciating, yeah, of course. Yeah, that I had kept Operation IV in circulation and we were at that point beginning to approach like hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million records sold and um but their band and Green Day and some of the other bands too. Avail is another one. They were not quite as big, but they they sold a lot of record. You know, they they loved being on lookout. We got along great, and so this this was the kind of thing that you know, if I had stayed at lookout, I would have hoped to have been continued to work with a lot of these people for forever. But there were others, yeah, that that changed. And yeah. I don't think I need to get into a lot of gossip and uh, or criticism or whatever. You know, some people are very insecure about money. And so naturally, like, you know, the minute that they have any kind of worries or pressure, like, oh, I gotta, you got to, you know, you got to make <laughs> me a star right away or else I won't be able to pay my house payment, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that... 
Um, once again, though, I think I got to take a certain amount of responsibility because a lot of these people were very young and very inexperienced in the world. Mm -hmm. And in, in many cases I, I could, I could and should have just said, well, I did say this a lot, but not everybody listened, but I would say just calm down. You know, many bands were, be were where you are before and they just kept at it. They kept, just kept playing shows. They just kept writing good songs and, and now they're much more successful. This will happen to you too if you just keep at it, keep doing the work, and don't stress too much about it. Don't. It's not the point of all of this is not to become a famous rock star in being in all the magazines or on TV. The point is to develop your art and get it to the people. And you know, if you if you persist in that, you will have success. It may not be millions of dollars but you will have success. You will feel good about yourself and about your life. Yeah. And Listen, I, I did not do good well enough at communicating that message, I guess. I'm very happy that you mentioned the fact that Joe Queer, and I have the same experience, is a really, you know, he doesn't care too much about money. And from my experience, having two with him a lot, he's really, really generous. And this brings me to a, a little touchy subject. And I show you <laughs> this first. So when, when you came to Punk Rock Raduno, you, you were surprised that we used, well, we basically copied, you know, these kind of rules in our festival, you know, no racism. Copied that from Gilman, yeah, from, from, from Gilman, yeah, of course. And so of we, course, uh, we, we all have that, yeah. <laughs> we, we all stand for this and we really believe in this and we think these messages are really connected with the with punk and in general on the way we are at the same time i see a lot of happening that the punk world but the world in general is getting very very judgmental and uh, they're always on the verge of fighting each other like it seems like you know the punks instead of fighting the real enemy fight each other so one thing that really pisses me off is that you know, I, I, I hear a lot of times like, oh, you two with Joe Queer, he must be an asshole, he must be this, he must be that, and blah, 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 blah. And he's exactly the, the opposite of the way he is. And and I'm sure a lot of people tend to think that, you know, they know someone or they can judge someone just based on, you know, a wrong message or like, you know, a post on Facebook or something that, or a mistake that someone did once, which of course we, you know, we might not agree with that mistake and we... But at the same time, you know, it's really crazy to see how much people cares about pure, being pure or purity. You know what I mean? It's like, it seems like uh, you cannot fail anymore. Otherwise, you're out. I was, uh, I wrote in my, in the, in the book you have there um, about Joe um, that sometimes he would say things that people would get very upset about. Uh, and we're kind of like what they call not politically correct or mm -hmm. worse. And I would say, I said it was kind of like, you know, uh, this might not sound right because Joe is older than a lot of punks, but he's younger than me. But I say it's kind of like your grandma, who's a very nice lady, but she sometimes says things like they used to say when she was young that are no mm -hmm. longer considered acceptable and i you know certain certain words to describe people from other cultures or other races or just people who are different at one time that was just normal you grew up talking that way and nowadays people are more aware of this but i i i got that idea not because joe is an old grandma but from my my aunt in in england who was even older than my mother and she was extremely left-wing, extremely open to people of all cultures. She deliberately chose to live in the mixed race part of, of London. Um, always, you know, had friends of all races, but she would sometimes say things that, uh, you know, use the kind of words that she grew up using that I would be like, no, no, you don't say that anymore. And she said, why ever not? And I would explain it to her, and she said, oh, okay, I see. 
but then she'd forget and say it again. Um, that's not to say that she was perfect, and it's not to say that, that Joe is perfect. He and I, over the years, have had many discussions about many things. We agree about some things. We disagree about others. Um, but he, he's, he's speaking a certain kind of viewpoint that, you know, he says, he says certain things that I wouldn't say. Um, and yet, like you say, he's got a very generous spirit uh, and a warm heart. Uh, however, in most of, among most of the younger people I know, he is now kind of almost like a, denounced as a, a, an evil person. Mm -hmm. And this kind of, it, it's, it's an especially American tendency, although it happens to people all over the world. Every so often they have like this purification thing, like uh, in, in traditional times in America, it would be in the form of Christianity, where the preacher would come to town and say, all right, you're all sinners. And who is, you know, they would, he would like get everybody who admit who was a sinner. And it, if you had ever said or thought or done anything that made you a sinner, they would tie you to a stake or even kill you. Um, and it would be like this, this what mass hysteria, this wave of mass hysteria, like, like where everybody had to be pure and nobody could ever do even one small mistake. Um, and now that America or and Europe are not such religious places as they used to be, and Christianity is not so strong, it feels like the same kind of energy has been taken to, like, if you don't agree with every single thing of this particular politics or morality or punk rock rule, then you are a sinner. You are an outcast. You must be pushed out from the, the, the culture. You must be banned. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't call people to account. If they say things that are genuinely racist, we should say that is racist and you, I, we don't think you should say that. If you, if you see somebody being cruel to another person because of their gender or their sexual orientation or any reason, really, we, we should speak out and we should say so. But there are many, there are many areas in which just because you don't agree with everybody about how to go about stamping out racism, for example, it doesn't necessarily make you a racist. It means that you have a different view of how to go about it. And, um, you know, I'll probably get myself in trouble for that. But, you know, every I mean, I, I'm hesitant almost sometimes, and I don't think this is good, but I'm hesitant sometimes to even raise the question. Yeah, like, I, I, I totally understand the feeling. And just... What would you do, for example, like we saw in the recent years, many record labels, for example, you know, they they reacted to do certain controversies of their labels or of their artists or their, you know, bands. And, you know, as soon as the controversy they, it will start, they will kick out the band. They will kick out the artist. You know, they will take part of something like we, we saw that with... You know, many artists recently, as soon as there is some kind of controversy, just to be, you know, purified, as you say, like they, they just, you know, prefer to they, not. They, they disappear. They become like in, 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 in the George Orwell's book, 1984, they become unpersons, like they never existed. Yeah, um, exactly. And the, tr the trouble with this question, and it's almost an impossible question, because there are some people who probably deserve that. There are some people who are real criminals who have done really harmful, destructive things that at one time would have overlooked, people would have overlooked it, that nowadays we don't overlook. But there are other people who maybe did something that wasn't that good. Maybe they made a pretty bad mistake even, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they're a terrible person who can never become better. Um, and... You know, we can't, I don't think we can generalize about that. You know, the people who make the decision, if they actually know the members of the band and have, you know, interacted with them, maybe they're in a better position to decide, like, oh, I, I think this is a bad person, so I don't want to work with them anymore. But for me, sitting here in my apartment, and I don't even know these people, I just know that somebody said they were a bad person, I have no way of knowing if, that, if that's true 
or if that's not true. Um, uh, you know, we go, we tend to be, Americans especially tend to be very extreme. We go from one extreme to the other. At one time, you could say all sorts of words and do all sorts of things, especially as long as if you were a white man, you could get away with all kinds of things that nobody should get away with. Um, now it almost is kind of going the other direction where you can't get away with anything. And, you know, nobody, no human being is perfect. I mean, even, you know, I'm, even if you're not religious, you know, Jesus himself, the founder of the, of Chris, or not the founder, but the, the, the big guy in Christianity said, let, ye, let you who is without sin cast the first stone. And I don't know anybody who's perfect. I don't know anybody who never said anything racist or sexist, you know, I, you know or, or I don't know anybody who never did anything dishonest. But the question is, at what point, where, where do you draw the line? Can you draw the line? How much should you forgive and how much should you not forgive? If, some, if, if you say to somebody, look, I think what you said or did was wrong, and they say, oh, I didn't realize that. Can you help me you know, change? Then I think they should be given a chance to change. If they say, well, you go to hell because I do what I want because I'm punk or because I'm whatever, uh, maybe you do have to cut your ties with them then. Yeah. Did it ever happen to you when you were running uh, Lookout Records that, you know, some contro controversies uh, happened and you had to face the, 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 the uh, a decision of kicking someone out or, you know, not releasing someone? There were, there were some people that at some point I chose not to work with anymore, but it was never over anything serious like this. Uh, okay. There was a couple of cases where people got became uh, drug addicts, and were, and which I I just from my own experience, I've been around a lot of drug addiction in my in my lifetime. I my experience is that you cannot count on people who are addicted to drugs to be reliable or trustworthy. Um, where I really where I really do the line though is when they were supplying drugs to other people and uh, uh, that was a much bigger problem than you know there, there were a number of people who I'm not going to name names but who were associated with Lookout who developed drug problems but in most cases I did not say okay you're kicked off the label but you know I tried to encourage them to get help and in, in many cases they did and it worked in some cases it didn't work and Some of them are no longer with us, um, but not, um, you know, not not so much with uh, some of the issues that are most common today. And and people might say, "Oh, yeah, but what about so and so or so and so?" He should have, um, you know, I cannot go 25, 30 years in the past and say, you know, this is the this is a, one of the hardest things I think with. Uh, with young people and even not so young people, but it's very hard to, until you're older, it's very hard to grasp that new things do change, that things that were completely normal when you were a child or a young man are now considered pretty terrible. There are mm -hmm. certain words, certain actions, certain attitudes. Uh, you can't really, unless you have a time machine, you can't go back and say, to somebody in the 1950s, you should not use these words or you should not live this way, it, it would make no sense. It would be like a space, a person coming from outer space and talking in, in Martian to you. You know, they would not, it would make no sense. And, and yet, uh, when you're young, you, you want everything to be perfect right away, yeah. today, in five minutes, in fact. And, That's not to say that older people like myself shouldn't continue to, to learn and to grow and to, I mean, Aaron Kamebus, although he's not that much younger than, well, he's younger, but not that much younger. He has been a, a very good guide because he himself has been on a journey. And a couple of times he's pointed out to me things that I wrote or said that were, were sexist without my even thinking about it. 
like I made a joke about some riot girls once and uh, in a, about another woman band. And I thought it was funny. And he said, no, that's really disrespectful. And I got really angry with him instead of thinking about myself. Mm -hmm. And it took, it took a while, maybe because I'm older, but after a few years, I like, oh, gosh, Aaron was totally right. I was judging that, that woman musician based on how she looked rather than how she played. And that's terrible. But at the time, it was so normal. It was so common that it didn't, that I thought he was being the weirdo. And, and it took a while um, for me to, to realize. And, and because of that, but, but Aaron was not like one of those people that was like, okay, you can't be in the scene anymore. He was like, just very gently said, you should really think about this. You know, think, think if you were in her place, if somebody said yeah. that about you. Um, and because he did it that way, I did think about it and I did learn and I did grow. If he yeah. had kicked me out of the scene, I don't know. I don't know if I would have learned a lesson from it. Yeah. I think right now, like, and we copied that from, uh, from the, the, the way you, you said that Americans are becoming like, you know, just the fact that you, you don't agree with that. And uh, if you see someone saying a racist thing or homophobic thing, and the, you just confront them saying like, Hey, this is not right because of this, 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 just for the fact that you are not kicking them out or canceling them. It seems like you are in some way accepting <laughs> the, the, the thing you're against that, which to me makes me really angry because uh, you know, I'm the same attitude as you just explained. You know, I, I, I hate people being racist. I hate be people being homophobic or I hate, but I also hate the fact not giving a person, you know, the, a second chance or not allowing people to change, you know? I was trying to think of the Italian uh, word, words for this. I think that Le azioni fanno più more uh, rumore che, che parole. Or Le, actions, yeah, yes. Actions, actions speak louder than words. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I think when it comes to things like racism and sexism, that is a a, a problem. Uh, and a, you know a, that people don't really fully understand this. Many people, especially from the older generations, they might say words that you would think is completely unacceptable, whether it's like a, a, a racial term or an attitude. But then you look at their personal lives and they show complete respect for people of all races and live their lives in that way. Um, and that's, I mean, that's not always the case, of course. Many, many older people just plain are racist and sexist because that's how they grew up. But there, there is no one test of what is pure or, or not. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I, I don't know. I think for, for example, many of the, many of the people who have the biggest mouth about this is what about uh, all these issues, they tend to be, uh, middle-class people from suburban areas who have never really had that much contact with, with people of different races and cultures. And they come to the city when they are finished university and say, okay, now I'm going to teach you all how to live. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a kind of a fantasy version. They, they, they have all these, the, it's almost like cartoon characters of how all these different people from different cultures and races are supposed to be in their in their revolutionary playset, and it's not really based on experience or reality at all. Whereas many just ordinary working class people who didn't go to university and study comparative cultures and all of that, you know, but they did work in factories and uh, and live in neighborhoods where they they came in contact with people of all cultures and races, and they have a you know, they may not be perfect, but they have a more realistic view. But, you know, you try telling a 20-year-old who just finished university and has a, has a whole plan for how to make the world perfect, you try telling them how to, uh, that, you know, maybe you need to think about this a little bit more. Maybe you need to look at your contradictions. 
Well, you know, I was 20 years old once too, and I, mm -hmm. I knew everything also. <laughs> and uh, nobody could tell me anything. So I can't judge too harshly. Um, in fact, I was a lot, you know, most people, by the time they get out of their 20s, they start to realize that they don't know everything. And they start yeah. to be, I was a lot older than that. So uh, <laughs> I, was, I, I, I was still kind of a know-it-all even when I was uh, in my 40s and running lookup. So uh, I I'm, and beginning, I'm beginning now in my 70s to, uh, to finally, I think, learn a few things. And I hope this will continue. So going back to the fact that, you know, you are the teacher, you know, you know the <laughs> punk rock teacher. So there is one, one thing. You all get, a, to you all get a, a, a failing, or I mean, a passing grade. Yes. <laughs> a is for everybody. So in this book, I think it is in this one that you mentioned the fact that you taught Fat Mike how to assemble his, uh, you know, the, the or to explaining him uh, where to find the stuff to start his record label so fat whack so you explain him if i'm not wrong where to print the sleeves for the seven inches he was releasing of he, no the, effects the, or something. the specific the specific story was that he was going to put out his first seven inch and he didn't know where to get the plastic bags that you put the seven inch into because back then yeah. we just print a sleeve and then put the record and sleeve into a plastic bag and I said, oh, well, here's where you get them. But he said, oh, I, I need them right away. And I offered to, to, uh, to that he could uh, buy some of mine because I had a, a, an extra box. So he, I met him at the warehouse, at More Damn Records Warehouse, and, uh, and we got the plastic bags, and I showed him how it worked. And, and uh, I, in, the, in the course of doing so, I asked him why he was starting a record label, and he said, Oh man, I seen how much money Brett uh, from Brett Gerowitz was making from Epitaph, but I figure uh, I should get some. Of, I should make some of that too. And I was shocked because at that time in San Francisco, you weren't supposed to admit that you ever wanted to make any money from music. It was just it's maximum rock and roll. It was just you, even if you did want to make money, you had to pretend you didn't. And he was just he was you know he had more of a Los Angeles attitude. He was like. Just, he would just say anything, and he is still like that. He will say anything, um, and many of the things he says are very controversial, and people get very angry with him and or make fun of him, all sorts. But the fact is, you know, he runs a good label. I mean, it's not my style of music, but almost all the bands I know that ever went to work with him, they got paid, they got taken well care of, good care of. Um, you know, for all his talk, he has, uh, he has, you know, he's done a, he's done a good job, but we're very different people. We, we have very different styles, uh, tastes in music and very different values. I just thought the funniest thing was, and I mentioned it in a book was, you know, I, I said, well, th so those bags are cost like $3 or something like that. It was a very trivial amount, but he, he looked like I would, it really insulted him. I, you want me to pay for them? And this is when right after he just got finished talking about all the money he was going to make from his new record label. <laughs> and I was still, you know, it was still early days. I mean, Lookout was doing all right, but I was like, well, yeah, we don't, we didn't get them for free. And all I'm asking is you should pay the same thing that we pay for them. But uh, he was just, that's just his, it's just his style. I mean, he paid, but, um, and I, I, Honestly, the last time I I saw him, gosh, the time before last I saw him, he invited me to go on tour. I mean, we're not close friends. Like we've only met a few mm -hmm. times over the years, but we, you know, some contact. But he invited me to go on tour with uh, No FX in Europe, and he telling me all the all the drugs we were going to do. And I mean, this I don't use drugs, so, so I was like, that doesn't really sound very appealing to me. And he was like. Oh, well, you can come anyway. You don't have to do drugs. <laughs> <And> <laughs> you're allowed to, even if you don't take I drugs. Just yeah. if, 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 you're not, if you're not a drug taker and you've ever sat around watching other people drink or take drugs, it's, it, it's not nearly as exciting as they think it is. That's for sure. And then the last time I saw him was at the uh, premiere of the East Bay uh, Turn It Around, the story of East Bay Punk. Um, yeah. Me. And he was so funny. He was uh, he was dressed in I can't remember. It was a, a very bizarre costume. It was 
sort of half dress, half clown, and he was just really going crazy. And and yet, you know, I might not see him for five years at a time, but when we've never had an argument or a fight or anything. When I do see him, it's just like, uh, you know, I ha I have I disagree with him about many things, but I have a good feeling about him, uh, and I wish him I wish him well. And, I don't know how we got on the subject, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering what you thought about, you know, Fat Wreck and Happy Tough. You know, there, there, there was some kind of rivalry back then, or, you know, the, the fact that you, you know, you were based in Berkeley and they were in Los Angeles, the attitude, the way they were doing things. I wouldn't call it a, a rivalry. I mean, there was always a, a rivalry between Southern California and Northern California, but not so much like we were trying to get the same bands or anything. Um, yeah. it, it's just a very different cultural scene. Like I, I referred to about Mike also, um, in, in Los Angeles, they, they don't hesitate to say, I want to get a record deal. I want to make a m money. I want to get on a major label. It's just part of the atmosphere there. That's, that's the culture of Southern California. It's the center of the commercial music and movie industry. And people grow up there just assuming that's how it works. Northern yeah. California is very different. It's, uh, you know, we had Maxim Rock and Roll telling us how to, to think and how to, what was important. And before Maxim Rock and Roll, we had the hippies and we, we had the beatniks and we had all the poets and all of the underground yeah. press. All of that was like saying, you know, money is, you know, we, we don't want money. We you, it's it's bad to want money. You um, so there was it was like two different worlds almost. And 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 Fat Records, although it was located in San Francisco, it, Mike had much more of a Southern California orientation. Yeah, he, he never hesitated to say like, you know, I I'm going to make money at this. But it's not it wasn't his only reason, but it was part of it. And. I see. Uh, so talking about uh, record labels, I think it's the time to have a record label owner back on the chat. Let's see if he's uh, if he wants to join in. And uh, now we are ready to have like two stars. Here we are. Welcome hey, back. Yeah, I thought it was going to be Brett Gurowitz. <laughs> that would have been fun. They look, they look a little bit alike, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize, but my connection was very bad through most of the of the stream. So Italian just, connection. Uh, excuse me. Italian connect. Typical Italian connection. Typical Italian connection, especially if you do not pay for it and uh, use uh, the connection from the people uh, the living upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but still. Uh, no, when the weather change is not good, uh, now this is not a good day. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Larry, for for being on our stream. I uh, really, I really. No, no, wait, wait, wait. We are not more, finishing the, this. The part. No, I'm, I, this is not a wrap up. This is just oh, okay. jumping in and say uh, I really have been enjoying uh, what you guys have been doing so far, uh, except for the bits that I didn't hear. But still, uh, I don't have. Um, Question, but I have a, a look at records memory, and also I cannot do questions because I I'm not sure what you guys already said or didn't. So <laughs> we were talking about record labels, and uh, I have a, a question for you both because we were talking comparing, you know, the, the attitude of Lookout Records and Larry compared to, you know, for example, Fat Mike or mm -hmm. or the, the the Southern California. Uh, talking about the the, the modern times and uh, how the, the record labels operate now don't you think larry that many of the record labels now they focus on artifacts you know for example you see wow. these labels even fat track for example making like you know beautiful records with uh, many colors and they seem to focus on uh, trying to i don't want to say cash in but they try to create request for specific records based on the fact that they have like you know uh they have buyers you know so you see like when an OFX record comes out you have like 10 different editions or collectible and they they focus on a lot of people that are fanatics or collectibles which 
I think in some way could be the opposite of what you were trying to do back then, which is, you know, trying to expose that, you know, art to as many people as possible. Actually, I don't remember so many Lookout Records from uh, your time being, you know, uh, color vinyl or many, you know, different quantities or extremely rare in a way that, you know, they were, you know, limited editions. Um, that's oddly, you're, you're right. There were, there were, uh, there were no, uh, colored vinyl. Um, by, by the way, I, I've had a, a technical, technical, uh, glitch that I, that I somehow oh. got kicked off. Oh, I, I think your internet connection, Andrea, caused the, 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 let's see if we can. <laughs> Join him, yeah. I really don't know what's going on, but uh, he's coming Larry, off. are you back? I am back. I got I got kicked off, but I heard all the questions. And uh, no, there was no colored vinyl. There was no money for it anyway, and I had never even heard of colored vinyl actually when I started. Um, it was one of the things that my first partner David Hayes and I used to uh, disagree about. Not disagree so much. We would have many discussions about it because he was much more into the uh, whole idea of making special collectible type items. And I didn't even understand why anybody would care. Uh, you know, it, it's, if we had followed his advice, we probably would have like a whole cupboard full of uh, very valuable records today. Um, but we didn't. I, um, my my philosophy was very different from his. He David was an artist, uh, a very talented artist, and he was very much into the whole package and creating something. I was more, I mean, almost completely into finding a way of getting music to the people. Yep. And I didn't I didn't care how that was done. Of course, we didn't have all the options back then of CD and. Uh, even cassette, um, let alone internet. But I wouldn't have hesitated to use any and all of them because my whole point was this is just a medium to get the music to the people. You know, um, he's not so well known or popular anymore as he used to be, but in the 60s there was Marshall McLuhan who coined a famous phrase called the medium is the message. And to me, the medium sent a message that this is the music of the people for the people reaching out to the people. And that meant whatever channel that it would find its way to the people, whatever channel you had to use, even, you know, I, I couldn't have imagined that in, in 30 or 40 years, music would go up into outer space to a satellite and then come back down to everybody's telephone. That would have yeah. seemed like the most crazy thing that, but I didn't have any objection to it. And when I was getting ready to leave Lookout, I said to the people, well, music is going to change. You know, the way that it's going to be distributed is change. It might come out on a microchip. It might come out, and God knows how. Be prepared for that. However, uh, there are many people today, maybe even it's now the dominant force, I think, in the punk rock scene, is it's all about fancy seven inches and colored vinyl and special gimmicks and stuff you know there's nothing wrong with that but it's something different it's it's a piece of art it's it's about more about the art than it is about the music um like i say again nothing wrong with it it's just not why i ever got involved i'm not a graphic artist i'm not a designer i couldn't i couldn't make a collectible record if you wanted me to i, I don't think except by accident and and of course some of the records i did put out did become collectible by accident because they turned, you know, only a few of them were made or something, but it's yeah. never my intention. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, in 1495, there's this guy Gutenberg invented a, a new way of uh, communicating called the printing press. And, and before that, all books were written by hand. They were called illuminated manuscripts and only very rich people could own them because I mean, literally, it would it would take months or years to just to make one copy of a book by hand. And I pictured some of the people nowadays who were like, "Oh, 
you should only be on vinyl, you should only do this. Or uh, If they were around in a 1495 or 1500, they would say, oh, I don't want these newfangled books. That's not, <laughs> that, these printed books, that's, that's like, destroys the whole message. I only illuminated manuscripts for me. Um, uh, I, they would be losing the point. The, the, the printing press made it possible for millions and millions of people to read books where they never could before. And modern technology enables millions and billions of people to hear music that they might never have heard before. So if, you, if people want to make fancy colored vinyl and really beautiful sleeves, that's wonderful. And I'm sure that some of them will be in museums someday. But it's quite different from the idea of getting, creating and getting music to the people. Sometimes they come together, but they don't have to. A lot of people ask this specifically if, uh, you know, uh, look out, if Lookout Records was now, which of course is a, a crazy question, <laughs> but uh, about Spotify or Digital World, or if you are, uh, uh, you know, pro or against, uh, you know, the, the, the Spotify streaming and stuff. And I guess you already answered with, with this one, you know. The, the, the... Uh, one of my good friends, uh, Joe from uh, Don Giovanni Records, who put out my uh, books and who reissued my uh, my band's records. As far as I know, he's very much against Spotify and he probably knows a lot more about it than I do. I, mean, I shouldn't say probably. I, I know he knows a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> um, but honestly, my view is whatever, whatever way there is of getting the music to, to people, you know, there's no sense in saying, oh, back in my day, we only had seven inch vinyl. I mean, when I was a child, we didn't even have uh, 33 RPM albums. They weren't, they weren't in, in stereo. They weren't invented yet. Yeah. We, we had 78 RPM records where you had to play only one song at a time. Uh, that was an album. <laughs> there would be like six records for an album. So what? You know, the, the, the sound quality was not nearly as good. They were a big pain in the ass to play. Um, you know, now I can pick up my, my telephone, which, believe it or not, at one time, the only thing you used the telephone for was to talk to people, and it was – it was fastened to the wall and you couldn't move it. Well, now I can pick up my phone and hear any kind of music that was ever made in the entire history of the world. Well, you know, you lose, win some, you lose some. Uh, yeah. I do not want to be one of those old people who say, you know, we should do it the way we did in my day. Cause you know, it's, you know, times change. Uh, that yeah. being said, uh, Joe from Don Giovanni runs a very successful label doing it his way. Um, and I, if he asks my advice, I offer it. If he doesn't ask my advice, which is usually the case, I don't offer it. <laughs> so uh, there's many different ways to run a record label. Uh, I, I have to do my, one, more Itali uh, one more Italian thing. Uh, Tutte le strade portano a Roma. Yes, exactly. Tutte le strade portano a Roma. Every road brings you to, to Rome. Yeah, they assuming you want to go to Rome, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I, I actually adopted it and said uh, all, all roads lead to Berg Bergamo. Uh, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> much more important. I, 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 two summers ago was my first visit. I've been to Italy many times, but I had never been to Bergamo or to that part of Italy before. And it was quite a revelation that it was so beautiful and it's so beautiful. It is. P please come back. There, there is a an, another thing. You know, we both. You know, me and Andrea try to to run the record labels, and uh, there is a um, reading your book. Like, it seems like a, an important aspect of running a record label right now is promotion. You know, everything is promotion. Is 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 getting ads is getting views and stuff and uh, you have like a specific you know way of talking about promotion on lookout <laughs> which is you basically rarely had promotion of your records or you rarely paid for ads actually funny enough the the 
the label had these uh, first financial problems, I guess, w after you left because they, they invested too much in promotion. This is, that this, is, this is my opinion. Uh, you could you could probably ask those people if they, if they agree. But, um, yeah, my opinion was that they were – they were trying to promote themselves into being bigger, whereas we had already gotten very big without promotion. And, um, you know, for the, I, I tell that story in the book for many, for many, uh, for a long time, bands would come to me and say, well, if you would promote us like you did Operation Ivy and Green Day, then we would be big like them too. And I, and I would say, we spent maybe a hundred, $150 promoting them and all, you know, we made an ad in Flipside and Maximum Rock and Roll and we sent out a, about 10 or 20 records to, to radio station. That was it. That was the promotion. Uh, everything else they did just by playing, making good records and playing good music. Um, obviously you can't stay that way forever, but there is no better promotion than by getting some, some kid or some adult really excited enough about your music that he goes and or she goes and tells their friend their friends and says yeah. this is great you should listen to it um and it was funny because in the first couple of years a lot of our sales were by mail order and i did most of it myself by hand and it was almost like i could see this map of the of america where some somebody from some little village in the middle of Nebraska or Iowa or North Dakota would order a record that they saw an ad for at Maximum Rock and Roll. And then within uh, the next month or two, three more, and then eight more kids would, would send in for more records. And pretty soon it would be like a little lookout colony in the middle of yeah. America. There were dozens of these. And some of these kids would grow up and come to Berkeley and some of them would go on to have careers in, in the arts and music. But I, I was, it was like little lights going on all across the country where just, all it took was just one record somehow or even a cassette. Somebody made a cassette for their friend and mailed it to them. And they would say, wow, this sounds cool. And they want to know more about it. That was promotion. That was the, the best promotion by far, uh, that, and one other aspect of that is, I kind of almost consciously, when we started the label, I aimed it at the uh, the younger kids, the ones, because remember by that time, punk had been around over ten years, and yeah. a lot of the old school punk bands were less poppy and more like growly and angry and <laughs> and very serious. And, and it felt like that was not speaking to the young teenagers. And so in a way, our, because our ads and our graphics were, were very amateurish and very silly and fooling around, I think that related to the kids, to the, to the really young kids that said, this is your music. This is not like your, your grumpy big brother or your dad's punk rock music. This is your punk rock music. And they and they really related to it, um, you know. So just like at Gilman itself, many of the the kids that came to Gilman and started bands were only 14, 15, 16 years old. And the older punks, the ones in their twenties and thirties, they were they got very angry. They had these kids don't know anything about punk rock. They're not doing it our way. And the kids will be like, "Yeah, we're doing it our way, and it's better." <laughs> yeah, yes. cool. And that that was the best promotion to me uh all, when when the other people at lookout said we, we need to put an ad in rolling stone magazine or spin magazine i was like i don't know anybody especially not myself that ever bought a record ever because they saw an ad in one of those magazines <laughs> and, and it's still true but yes. and they cost a fortune i mean some of those ads in one of those big magazines would cost more than the than the whole pressing of of our of a uh, of one of our records just just to yes. put it uh, up an app we, we give you an italian word on this the tarma one of the listeners say passa parola that means word of mouth word of mouth yes you know yeah, word perfect of mouth. yeah exactly word of mouth yeah and and uh yeah no i you know i think what you say is 
is totally true. And uh, another well, thing on the late... thing. Who, who are you going to believe? Your best friend who told you this is a good band or some commercial magazine from New York City or Los Angeles? Yeah, and also, <laughs> I, I know when you were talking about, uh, you know, people uh, getting lookout, ordering lookout records uh, from all over the United States, and uh, I'm sure you know that at the same time that was happening also in Europe and across the world, uh, I lived uh, about 45 minutes from a town called Pisa, where there was a, a record shop and distributor called White Records, and they were a distributor for I've heard, I've heard of them. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so they had the, they, 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 they sold the Lookout Records all across Italy, and also they had a record shop. Then we, so we took the train when we were kids, went to White Records, and we could, uh, you know, find in the record store all the, all the Lookout releases. Uh, right where they were out, or a few months, uh, just a few months uh, later. So that was our, you know, <laughs> favorite trip for Saturday afternoons. Yes, you're you're right. We began selling records to Europe pretty quickly, uh, not a lot, but by mail order. And this is a big difference. It makes me. This is one thing that I get really angry about. Um, in those days, it was possible to send an album to Europe for only a a little bit more than it costs to send in the United States, maybe a dollar or two extra mm. by airmail, and it could be there. And now it's a trend all over the world, but uh, especially in America and Canada, they have raised the postage rates mm -hmm. so much that the postage costs two or three times more than the record. Yeah, it's a bit crazy at the moment. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a political thing that, that people mm -hmm. don't, they want to wipe out the post office, basically. They want to, they, the extreme capitalists think that the post office, well, they don't believe in any government services. And the post office is a government service that does a very good job. And so they want to destroy it. And they have raised the rates and made the service much worse and hoping that eventually people will say, oh, we don't need a post office anyway. We'll just send everything by Fed, Fed, FedEx or UPS for, for 10 times more money. And that's unfortunately what's happening. It, it, it makes me very angry that people would be so narrow-minded and short-sighted. But Yeah, and you see these changes are also influencing the, the, the little DIY scene uh, to the point that uh, we, can, uh, we, we can feel that uh, in the past couple of years, it's become very different to relate, to trade the records with labels from the United States, to be in touch with the label from, uh, from uh, across Europe. <laughs> but Even to keep records with the main order, it's been more expensive and uh, more difficult. But can they not just send digital files over <laughs> and then people press their own? I, know. I, know, I, I agree with you. With uh, I mean, uh, I run a record label. Uh, we do uh, like different versions of the same records of different vinyl colors, which is something that I dislike, definitely, because I, I always believed that it was uh, uh, like a way to take advantage of the collectors. I feel like a, a collector, when he has uh, the mission of having the same records in all the colors available, uh, if you print it in two colors, you make, you, you're doing something funny. But if you're printing wow. it in four, six, eight, ten colors, uh, this is beca becoming really taking advantage of people collecting. Well, everybody needs a hobby uh, if they don't have Yeah, of sure. uh, As a record label owner, I'm doing uh, this thing. Uh, especially with the last titles, we're printing different colors, and I say it helps a lot my label. So, uh, I well, believe, you have uh, to survive. That's, that's important to survive. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And also, I believe it is fun that uh, mm -hmm. uh, one day you, sent, uh, you, you ship uh, records to a distributor and uh, white vinyl, and uh, after a few months you ship the same title, it's a different color, but I, I don't care much uh, of this about these things. But still, mm, I, I feel a little dirty <laughs> while doing this. Well, you know in, I mean? in, in the future, they will have eventually. We'll have a time where you can teleport the records all over the world. You won't need a post office anymore, like on Star Trek. Where yeah, they I know, but for example, <laughs> that you know that um, now they're gonna sell a work of art with uh, an exclusive, unique file 
that is going on the auction. Yes, I, 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 I am aware. Uh, I don't know how, how it's called this thing. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the first time I feel like I'm I'm almost too old to understand what they're doing. <laughs> exactly. But it's, they're doing it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, happening, uh, it's happening online too. <laughs> it's part of life. What? What can I say? I have very many uh, things to keep me busy that that I don't need to worry about what everybody else is doing all the time. <laughs> well, actually, Team Time Bomb did that. It was really successful. And a friend of mine that does uh, punk art uh, is now making a living with selling art online, you know, with those... I, uh, I, I, I don't know the name. And well, as long as there are getting... ways to support the artist, I'm happy about it. Yeah. Non fungible token, I think it stands for. Yeah, you're you're right. Perfect. Yeah, and um, yeah, couple other things because I know a lot of people sent questions. Say they they want answer. <laughs> so you once said in an interview that it's really important for a record label owner to keep reminding their la their bands how much they love them. You know, to feel them, to make them feel appreciated. But at the same time. You also expressed on this interview how much important it is to take care of business, you know, to pay royalties, yeah. to run your label, you know, efficiently. So which side do you think is more, more important? Like, you know, the, the, the more personal aspect of, you know, reminding a label how much you love them, the, the personal relationship with them, or they're running the business, uh, you know. Well, the the, uh, there, the, there's no... Uh... You can't separate one from the other. If, if you uh, if you love them, then you take care of them and you make sure that, that they get paid. That's you know it, you know it's no good a parent telling his children that he loves them if he doesn't feed them. Uh, so, uh, in fact, one thing I complained about in the book was that what what a problem that I had being a label guy was that. I wasn't good enough at like always saying every, telling people, oh, everything you did is fantastic. I love the new record. I, you know, if I'm, I'm the kind of guy where I grew up, if you didn't think the record was good, then you didn't say the record was good. In fact, you probably said it's terrible. Um, my attitude was, look, if, if I'm putting your records out on my label, obviously I think you're good. So I don't need to keep telling you over and over again. Um, but not all bands feel that way. Some bands are very sure of themselves. They know what they're doing is good. They don't need somebody to, 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 to constantly like pat them on the back and hold their hand. But others are more insecure and they do need that. But one yeah. of the things I was always trying to get bands, some bands at least, is to take their business seriously. I'd say, look, if you, if you don't take care of your business, somebody else will and you might not like it. And I would say to these then certain bands, and the Joe Queer was one of them. Be like, I don't care. I just want to play my music, man. And uh, and I was like, yeah, but after you've been doing it 20 or 30 years, and you got no money, and you're going to be pretty angry and pretty frustrated, and you might then feel like you want to have to do things you don't want to do. If you just do the most basic things now to look after. It doesn't mean you have to be a big, uh, you know, a, a corporation or anything. It just means you, you keep track of stuff. And the yeah. bands that succeed, they generally do that. They're aware of where the money's coming from, where it's going, what, what they got to do to survive. And um, I was always telling bands, please, please do that. It doesn't matter if you think you're going to sell only a few thousand records or a few million. It, you know, you got to show that much respect for your work. And some did, some didn't. Um, I, the ones who didn't, I tried to look after them as best as I could. But ultimately, if the bands want to go around throwing their money away or not collecting it in the first place, there's not that much I can. There's only so much I can I can do about it. But it, they do, you know, taking care of business and showing the love. They, they, they both. They're both part of the of the job. Last question, uh, no, Larry, oh, because you've been oh, okay. you you've been uh, so nice to sticking with us and answering all our crazy questions. 
this is a question I, I got the most. Like, you know, a lot of people write about this, but uh, there is one that I want to read in particular because you represent well this, uh, this question. Uh, let's see. This is the, the I read it. Larry, you started in 1987, this record label that has been inspiring for a lot of uh, punk workers and music lovers in general. At that time, did you start it with a real plan or has been just a, let's do it because we are in love with this? Now, after 34 years, I have a proposal for you. <laughs> let's do it again together. I'm sure there's someone out there that needs to do it. <laughs> Give us some suggestion, tips, and tricks to do a Lookout Records lookalike label now. So a lot of people is, is basically writing is like, do you feel about starting something? Or, you know, there, there is ever a chance to, to restart Lookout Records? Or if someone helps you out, would you ever consider it? Or in general, tip and tricks about starting a record label. Uh I'm sure many people have heard the saying that history does, doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. In other words, there were, there are it, uh, there are similarities that keep happening all through history. And just as there was a lookout records at one time, there will be some other cultural phenomenon in, in future times that will be similar, but it won't be the same. If somebody wants to, to try and start a lookout type record label in, in 2021 with a similar type of music and a similar type of aesthetic. Well, good luck to them, but I will not bother with that because it's not going to happen. Whatever is going to, to mean so much to young people of the present day or the future day, it's going to be different. It's going, it's going to have, it's going to have the same kind of love and the same kind of passion and the, the same kind of excitement, but it might be a completely different kind of music. It might not even be music at all. It might be an art and some kind of art. It's an interesting thing all through history at different times in history, like the people who were leading the culture at one time, it was poetry. Another time it was symphony orchestra and another time it was novels. You know, it just happened that in my time, it was pop music. It won't necessarily always be that way. There will always be music, but music might not always be on the leading edge of what is driving the culture. I, it's not, it's not my time or place to do that anymore. It's my, it's my time to do different kinds of work now. And if somebody wants to do a record label or another artistic enterprise today, and they, think that I have any valuable advice to offer, I will, of course, be happy to offer it. But uh, no way would I be starting a record label today. It's just not, it's, it just means something completely different today than it did then. Yeah, perfect. Larry, thank you so much. You're such thank an you. inspiring figure. And, and uh, first of all, two things, like you're, you have an open invitation to Italy, of course, to Bergamo in particular, and to our little dump festival. So, you know, every time you want to come down, you you will you will always be the king of our <laughs> little, uh, well, I, little yeah, castle. Do I get a crown? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. If you want, yes. Well, you can get one. I don't know. Do they have Burger King in England? I, I mean, excuse, excuse me, Burger King in Italy. They have. Crown Unfortunately, we do. Unfortunately, uh, we do. well, you we can pick up your crown there, maybe. Um, okay. Okay. No, I I um, I hope to return to to Bergamo and to that whole uh, that whole area of, of Italy again. There is so much more to see. I I also visited Milano for the first time on on that trip, and I only got to see two days of it. And there was so much. There's much more I want to see around there. Cool. And the second thing is that can we book a lookouts reunion at Panco Quaduno? Reunion of of, of, of the lookout, of, of the lookout, of your band, yeah, of the lookouts. I I think this is probably unlikely. I don't <laughs> remember how to play most of the songs. Um, um, our bass player lives on the other side of the world, and our uh, drummer is pretty busy with his with a, a new band. And you know, I'm not saying it will never happen, but it is not too likely. 
just take it in consideration you know you if you if you need you know just a little we talked about it a, a few times um but it's always kind of hey we should do that or that would be cool but <laughs> it, you know some things are better left to the past <laughs> <laughs> Larry, again, thank you so much, and uh, we will have you back for sure. I feel that, and we can't wait for uh, the, the the your third book. You know, the end of the the the, the three part series. Of Which, course, you know we we should mention that they can find your books and the, the reprints of your records at the JohnGiovanniRecords.com. I, I highly I heard, highly urge people to read the first book uh, before they read that book. Uh, the first book is called Spy Rock Memories, and it yeah. tells about when I went to live in the wilderness when I was sick of punk rock in the 1980s, and and how much to my surprise I ended up in the middle of the wilderness playing in a punk rock band and starting a fanzine, uh, not a fanzine, a zine, and starting a, a record label all in the middle of the wilderness, the, the last place. On. But it lays the it lays the groundwork and tells the story of how it all began. And the third book, um, which hopefully will come out in a year or so, um, it's the it's the last of the three uh, and yeah. wraps up the whole story. So they go together. It's not it's not just. Uh, I mean, you can read each one separately, but I hope people will read all three. I'm sure they will, and uh, I actually read two, so I'm waiting for the third one. Someone is commenting that you still owe us a, a gig, you know, because they were expecting you to play. Uh, a song uh, at the bike fellas in Bergamo. So mm. this is a good excuse to come back and play as a. An I wish I wish I would have, but I was a bit, uh, you know, uh, a bit nervous about it in uh, in realizing that that my acoustic or my semi-acoustic band, the Potato Men, was never quite as popular as the Lookouts. Uh, I didn't know how many people would be interested. I was surprised to find that quite a few Italians knew the Potato Men and knew the songs uh, of course. when i realized that i thought oh gosh i bet you they even were naming songs they wanted me to play i said i wish i had done that but i didn't and there they, you go that's why we have that, that's, well, that's why we, we yeah that's why you have to in Bergamo. <laughs> it's great uh it's great to visit italy even only over the internet and thank you for everybody who's watching and who uh answered all who asked all the questions and made all the comments you guys do some amazing work and i look forward to seeing you again and thank you so much larry ciao to everybody have a nice day, have a nice day. thank you there you go larry thank livermore <laughs> yeah congratulations on the interview it was pretty well uh, I'm, I'm so sorry i'm so sorry I, I couldn't, for I couldn't, what i couldn't be connected all the time but anyway <laughs> Don't worry, you can rewatch this on uh, Twitch. Exactly, that's what I wanted to ask you. Can we rewatch it on Twitch? And are we yes. posting this on YouTube? Why not? Why not? We, we just yeah, we, we should do it. Yeah, tomorrow probably we can post it on YouTube, and then you can rewatch it, and we I can rewatch it. I will. And and think about how many questions I didn't ask him because you know when you you know you 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 want to ask him like oh, and then I want to ask about this band and this other yeah. band. So I hope yeah. everyone understands that that you know we got so many questions and we wanted to it's just two hours know. long stream, and it's not even covering. Uh, yeah, the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The surface. There is a comment of uh, of Simone on the limited edition vinyl, which I would like to show another perspective of the thing. You know, as we mentioned it before, that you know the importance the of having people different colors are a bunch. This way, there's more opportunity for people to get one color record. Yeah, sure, why not? But uh, yeah, what I was, what I meant is that uh, I know a few people that uh, has uh, all colors of vinyls of the records they like, and uh, I really feel bad by releasing another color, knowing that they <laughs> had to buy it, uh, and I think it, it's uh, it's not really. It's not really good for a label to to rely just on this. I think a label should also care a bit about uh, uh, promoting the artist and helping the artist becoming uh, more uh, known in the scene than before releasing the record with you. Otherwise, the label is just the guy paying for the for the printing and selling the records, but it's not, it's not doing any other work 
Uh, so I just believe uh, it, it makes the, the record label meaningless, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. I see. I see your point. Perfect. And that's why you are not Fat Mike. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> so well, I'm, I'm just a guy <laughs> releasing a bunch of records. I'm well, not even you, you, you. You got a bigger catalog than mine. <laughs> you, 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 you. you uh, I prefer you than Fat Mike uh, <laughs> for what it's worth. But anyway, next okay. week. Same time, uh, we are going to announce the first band of uh, War Straduno, second War Straduno, and it's going to be a surprise. It's going to be a nice interview. Of course, uh, you know, uh, after Lever Livermore is, uh, is pretty hard to, to top there, but uh, we are going to try to give you some content. I hope you guys appreciate it, and uh, we hope you keep you company. And for sure, we, we you know, I felt, you know, uh, like I didn't waste my typical Sunday evening uh, just on the couch. So I'm really happy about that. And uh, yeah, that's it. Just stay connected with Pancor Carduno. Thanks again to everyone involved. Thanks to Susanna, Stefano, Bruno, you know, all the Pancor Carduno family. That they always thank you guys. See you next up. week. And yeah, thank you so much. Uh, subscribe to the channel and just, you know, believe we are going to celebrate soon uh, at Punk Rock Raduno and our uh, next Punk Rock show. Bye!